reason we're here today is to re-examine the use of high friction surfacing because um, its popularity seems to be waning a little bit. Some authorities have stopped using it completely. Um, and so today we want to sort of challenge some preconceptions about the product, uh, particularly about its service life, um, and particularly about um, alternative types of treatments, for example, high PSV asphalt. Do they perform the same as, as high friction surfacing? So um, that's what we're talking about. Um, there's different types of high friction systems in use, and the next speaker will go into those into some detail. Um, it was developed primarily to um, improve or reduce um, wet skid related accidents. The market grew to about 4 million square metres. Today it's less than a million square metres. So it's de decreased quite, quite markedly. Um, and I think the reduction really is tied in with the need for councils to reduce expenditure, reduce their maintenance budgets, um, and so on. So it's, sort of, it's got caught up really with all that um, uh, need to save on cost. And the perception is it doesn't last very long, it's, it's expensive, it's a discretion to spend, and we don't need to use it anymore. Um, and this is really why we, why we use it. Um, if you're into scrim and uh, measuring skid resistance, the market high friction is 0.5 scrim or above. Um, and achieving skid resistance under wet conditions is quite complicated. There's a lot of parameters that are affected. You can see some on the screen there. Uh, surface texture and the aggregate type is absolutely critical to achieving good uh, wet skid, re skid resistance. Um, and there's two types of texture. There's micro texture on the aggregates and there's macro texture, which is uh, the texture there. Uh, the reason that um, anti-skid is unparalleled really um, is largely down to the aggregate type that's used, calcite bauxite. Um, it doesn't polish. It's got a very high PSV, a very high resistance to polishing in the traffic. So it retains its micro texture, which is very critical uh, for achieving wet skin resistance particularly lower traffic speeds. Um, macro texture becomes more important as uh, traffic speeds increase. Um, we haven't got a presentation today on calcite bauxite, so I'll just say a few words about it. Um, the aggregate comes from bauxite clay, it's quarried in places like China and Guyana um, and India. It's calcined in a kiln, very high temperatures and it's an incredibly hard material, very high in alumina content. Um, there's been some research done over the years on its use and its performance, and you can see on the screen there, there are two um, footprints uh, which are meant to replicate the, the contact between the car tyre uh, and the road surface. You'll notice that the, the, uh, the footprint under the car tyre uh, travelling over a high friction surface looks quite different to a HRA surface. Uh, the, H the HFS surface provides lots of high pressure contact points, like needles really, uh, that provide very high friction. And you'll also notice that um, there's low density uh, on the high friction uh, footprint, which, which creates lots of uh, channels uh, to improve the hydraulic conductivity and help to shed the water between the, uh, the car tire and the surface. Um, we know um, high friction works, there's been lots of research done on its use over the years, lots of testimonials, um, we know it saves lives, and sometimes, it's, sometimes we need to just focus on the value it provides, not just the, the cost. Some work done by Rosper a number of years ago, they looked at different um, schemes, different ways of improving road safety, at the top there, um, anti-skid, they, they looked at 34 schemes, Average cost just over £8,000 a scheme. Um, the interesting figure is in the third column there, 57% reduction in accidents um, as a consequence of treatings and treating that's th those sites. And the full year rate of return, 352%. And high friction servicing is embedded in all of the specifications in the Spectre Highway Works, in the DMRB, the Design Manual for Rails and Bridges. Um, and I'm sure it features, or should feature, in every local authority's asset management plan and skid risk policy. 
you know that all the way of the, the new code of practice coming in in October, well managed power infrastructure. So it's a mandatory requirement now for authorities to have a skill this policy in November, we'll about that later on this morning. Uh, the specification clause is clause 924. Uh, it doesn't say very much, it just says that the system to be used should have uh, HAPAS or equivalent certification or product assessment. There's a code of practice uh, published by RSDA jointly with ADEPT about uh, a few years ago, about five years ago. It's been recently updated. Uh, the code of practice is important because it provides a basis for providing a five year guarantee. So we would encourage our authorities to think about um, uh, stipulating a five year guarantee in contracts. Uh, HD 36 is important, That's, that provides uh, guidance on um, how to uh, set your investigator levels and PSV requirements dependent on the site category. And HD 37 is part of the DMRB which is being updated. Um, there is a presentation later on today about HAPAS and the HAPAS scheme. Um, I think the scheme for high friction servicing was in fact the very first HAPAS scheme. I think it sp sprang into life about 1995. Uh, currently there's 21 um, certificates in issue, uh, which cover a wide variety of different types of um, high friction systems. And the important thing also is that the scheme covers both the performance of the product, uh, but also the um, the application of the product, so applicators also need to receive uh, HAPAS approval. Um, the market's changing, the BBA dominated this particular uh, product assessment certification scene for many, many years. Uh, we've now got uh, a company called PTS who are providing a similar type of, or an equivalent type of um, product assessment certification. Uh, so when to use it, I think Basically, your skid risk policy will outline where you should be using high friction surfacing. Anywhere where there's a screen requirement of 0.5 or above. But typically, approach it to roundabouts, crossings, junctions, uh, and where you've got a bad accident history on the side. I mentioned HD 36. Uh, this is um, table 3.1. HD 36 is now going to be called CD 236 the new DMRB as part of their revision. And, uh, but the, the table remains pretty much the same. Uh, the shaded uh, rows is the default value, an investigator level driven value for PSV. And you can see there where high friction servicing features uh, in the table, depends on the site uh, category. So out of the 10 site uh, categories in HD36, uh, only five currently require uh, high friction surfacing. And it's generally down to risk um, and traffic levels. Interesting piece of work done by uh, LOTAG, the London Technical Advisors Group, back in 2009. They published this interesting little um, diagram which clearly shows that accidents per kilometre uh, decrease with increasing skid resistance, perhaps not surprising. Uh, you can see there the high friction uh, features about 0.5 scrim. Uh, we're often asked uh, how long should the treated section be. Um, Highways England will use 50 metres of, of anti-skid generally. Jacob has published this uh, interesting table a few years ago where they're trying to relate uh, length of high friction to the actual traffic speed. It's the only uh, publication you can find that attempts to um, relate track their speed limit to length of treatment. Um, and I mentioned a few minutes ago one of the reasons why uh, some authorities have stopped using uh, anti-skid or at least using far less of it. It's because of this um, perception that you can use high PSA asphalt instead. They're very different materials. Um, I guess the simplest um, way of describing it is that asphalt will polish over time um, and on that basis the scrim will decrease. Uh, providing that the anti-skid system remains in place, uh, it should continue to deliver a consistent level of scrim over a longer period of time. Uh, and PSV uh, doesn't equal skid resistance. It's, um, it's a surrogate test really, it's, it tries to give you some indication of what these, the scrim value might be. Uh, some interesting work done by Somerset a couple of years ago where they scrimmed um, sites that have been treated with the SMAs make different quarries, all 60 PSV, 
and they found that the screen values did vary. So we know that screen doesn't necessarily uh, mean uh, skin resistance. And there's some interesting research done at the University of Ulster on the same theme using their road tester, a big beast of a machine. You've got um, a, a, a slab there under test under the wheel, which rotates around uh, and the wheel goes backwards and forwards to simulate um, trafficking. And after trafficking for 100,000 passes, they measure the surface friction. And you can see at the top there, you've got calcium bauxite, um, PTV, I think is pavement test value. In the middle there, you've got lots of different high PSV asphalts that are demonstrating lower uh, scrim value because they're polished up essentially. Um, if you haven't spotted it, again, there's a presentation later on this afternoon by TRL on this report. Uh, PPR 789, um, which compares the performance of high PSV asphalts versus um, anti skid. This is uh, based not in, the, not in the laboratory, but based on real live site uh, scrim data. Um, I'll not burst the bubble of TRL, but it's an interesting report, and it certainly supports some of the, the views you're going to hear put across today.